Wyandotte County General Election 2020. I am with Business West, the lead sponsor of the forum, along with Kansas City, Kansas Community College. The focus on the forum today will be on the races for state representative. I would remind the candidates that this is not a debate and would encourage them to stick to the issues. The panelists who will be asking the questions are Mary Rupert with the Wyandotte Daily Online, Elnora Jefferson with the Historic Northeast Midtown Neighborhood Association, and J.D. Rios, a former community college trustee. Candidates will have two minutes for opening remarks. And first, we will hear from Louis Reese. Louis. Thank you for the invite, and it's a pleasure to be here this uh, early evening. A lot going on today. You know, I just got over out of the kicked out of Wall Street Hospital with COVID. Oh no, that was the president. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things happening today. We're we're busy. We have another forum for one of our uh, people running for state senate to the uh, northwest here. I'll be running for my ninth term. I'm very proud to have served the third was 32nd district when I first was elected, and now it's the 31st district. Uh, it seems time has flown by when we were at JUCO debating the boundaries of uh, redistricting uh, with our old friend, Mike Peterson. Uh, a lot of things have transpired and has happened. We were really shooken up this last session because of what happened with uh, uh, the COVID and also Susan Weigel, while she shut down the session uh, prior to COVID because she was upset about the constitutional amendment that we that didn't pass, passed the Senate, didn't pass the House. There were some bills that we are up in limbo. One of my bills is up in limbo about the little boy who was fed to the hogs. Uh, we were waiting to get that down on the floor and hopefully passed. But I'm looking forward to hopefully next session, get rejuvenate uh, that bill, other bills, and try and work to maintain our uh, funding of education and get Medicaid expansion passed. And that's my opening statements. Okay, thank you very much. Valdenia is with with us now, so we'll go to her opening remarks. Valdinia? I appreciate it. I'm so sorry about technical difficulties, but we're working through it. So good um, afternoon. I am uh, Representative Valdina Wynn, and I am asking for uh, your vote on November 3rd to be reelected to serve as a 34th district representative. The boundaries of the 34th district are second to 72nd and state between state and, and Georgia. I was first elected in 2000. And so for the past 20 years, I have served and I'm proud of my record of, of standing up and speaking out for children, families, and, and all of the Wyandotte County state of Kansas, including those who usually don't have a voice in Topeka. As a former member of the Children's Cabinet, I have supported early childhood funding and especially uh, provided extra um, funding for expansion of child care services in Wyandotte County. Um, even had to go before the UG over these, these years to protect um, child care centers from potential harm. I uh, fought to protect in-state tuition and will continue if it comes back. And as a ranking member on the education budget committees, I continue to fight for equitable funding for public education, um, no matter what the zip code. And yes, I too proudly support the expansion of Medicare. This time, more than any time, we need to, to protect those Kansans. Uh, finally, I'm proud to say that I for the last two years, I've had the confidence of my fellow House Democrats as, as I've served as the assistant minority leader for the, for the House Democrats. So I ask for your vote for re-election. Uh, as a candidate for the 34th District, I am experienced, um, I'm courageous, and I'm qualified, more than qualified, um, to serve as a 34th District representative. So thank you. Thank you, Valdinia. Now we'll go to Pam Horton Curtis. Pam, your opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Um, 
First, I, I just want to thank all the sponsoring organizations for um, hosting this forum and to um, just say thank you to everybody who is participating. Um, I appreciate the opportunity that you've provided um, for this discussion. I think it's always beneficial when um, we take an opportunity to make sure that we have informed voters um, and, and actively uh, voters that are actively participating. So thank you. Um, I'm Pam Curtis, and I am very honored to serve as your state representative in the Kansas House. Um, the district I represent includes the downtown area and the surrounding neighborhoods to the south. Um, serving in the Kansas House is truly a dream that I had since working for Governor John Carlin. And um, five years ago, or six years ago, actually, that opportunity came my way. Um, uh, serving in the Kansas House um, is truly an honor. And as many of you are aware, the Kansas legislature is a part-time citizen legislature. And many of us have jobs outside of our legislative work. I'm real fortunate that the Greater Kansas City Chamber <laughs> gives me the flexibility and the time off without pay uh, to serve in the Kansas legislature. I'm also very lucky to have a boss in Joe Reardon that understands what it takes to serve. Um, I've been with Joe now as his chief of staff for 15 years, and we are at our fourth place together. Uh, it was Joe's dad that gave me my first job in politics at the Bicentennial Commission many years ago, and then I later went on to become the city's arts administrator. And when I returned from uh, working for Governor Carlin, I did economic development for KCK. So I really had a, um, a, a career in public service. Um, my husband, Steve, and I live in the St. Peter's neighborhood. We had a business in the old confectionery at 14th and Orville for about 12 years. And about two years ago, we purchased the old Conoco station that is across the street from where the studio stood. The studio is a work in progress. However, it will allow Steve to continue many of the wonderful community programs and work that he does in our neighborhoods. My son, Colin, lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Jane, and their dog, Bo. And Colin is temporarily in Kalamazoo, Michigan, managing a congressional race. So as you can tell, I'm very proud of my family. I was born at St. Margaret's Hospital, grew up at 7th and Pacific until I was about 10, and my family moved to a house at 7th and Pyle, our front yard faced Bethel Neighborhood Park. Again, thank you for the opportunity. This is such an important election, and the best decisions are made when voters are engaged and informed. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Pam. Now we'll go to uh, Tom Burroughs for introductory remarks. Tom? Thank you, Merle. And I too wanna to thank Business West and the Kansas City, Kansas Community College for hosting this forum this evening. I think it's extremely fortunate that we have those interested in what's occurring in Topeka and what happens in Topeka and how it affects our community and their individual lives. I have served in the Kansas legislature 12 terms, and I'm proud of that extensive record. I've served in some of the longest sessions in modern history and some of the shortest sessions in modern history. The last handful of uh, the last couple of decades has been it's been tough as a legislator uh, for all of us, but we, we get through it. We work hard. We're committed to doing our jobs. I've had the privilege of serving almost on every committee that the legislature has put forward at one time or another throughout my career. In the 22 years, I spent six of those in the uh, leadership position. And I'm, I'm pleased to state that I presently serve on the Appropriations Committee. I'm also the ranking member on the General Government Budget Subcommittee, which we do about 27 individual budgets uh, of agencies and departments. I serve on the Commerce and Labor Committee with a number of my Wyandotte County colleagues. I also serve on the Legislative Post Audit. I've served on that committee, I believe it's 18 years now. And I, and, um, as an in, in the interim positions, I serve on the Kansas Economic Recovery Committee. I've also had three governor's appointments to various committees throughout my career, and most recently chair of the Kansas Athletic Commission. So we have an extensive background. I've introduced a number of bills that have passed. The first 10 years, we never lost a bill that was introduced. I'm very proud of that. A couple of those bills were the Star Bonds bill that brought the village West and the Kansas Motor Speedway to Wyandotte County, carried that bill as a freshman legislator. 
and then also Senate Bill 66, which is right at the top of my head back here, signed by our former governor for the gaming bill that we worked 12 years to bring to Wyandotte County and the number of jobs and the tremendous economic impact it's had on uh, our community. I'm very proud of uh, my strong economic background. I stand ready to assist all other legislators in a bipartisan manner to advance policies that benefit all Kansans. And I'm very proud and honored and humbled to come from Wyandotte County as one of the more senior members in the legislature. It does, uh, it does my heart well when I know that we have strong soldiers from the Wyandotte County delegation that fight the good fight on a daily basis while we're in session. Thank you, Tom. Now we'll move to Jordan Mackey for his opening remarks. Jordan. Hello, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to pop in and see everyone. Uh, I know that um, the majority of folk here are on the other side of the age. I respect greatly, and um, I'm actually really excited to be uh, invited to this event. Um, as the outsider candidate, uh, both within my own party and even within Wyandotte itself, uh, it's a lot of fun arguing one day with the GOP or arguing uh, with Tom via Facebook or something else. Uh, I've learned a lot in the past couple of years. I've been blessed to be working under Mayor Harrington uh, for the fast for the uh, for the past three years. I've been on Bonner Springs City Council. I was the youngest. Uh, person elected to Bonner Springs Council in our uh, hundred so year history, 1888. Uh, Mr. Cooper would get frustrated with me if I didn't know the exact date. Um, I come from a union family, both my stepfather and all of my uncles on my mother's side have all been um, either bricklayer, iron worker, teamsters, or uh, my grandfather worked for Procter and Gamble uh, before he bought an 80-acre farm in Tonganoxie. Um, one of the, one of my proudest accomplishments that was actually uh, one thing that taught me how to work with everybody, not even necessarily across the aisle because uh, city council is uh, nonpartisan, but I was proud and honored that for all of Wyandotte County, we were able to convince Old Dominion to stay here and not go over to Shawnee it was a great opportunity for us uh, and we'll be adding a $45 million facility. It'll actually be Old Dominion's largest facility in the United States that will be going right here into Bonner Springs. Uh, that was a blessing that all of the council people, we worked very, very diligently and very hard on that. And I got my first taste of real legislation whenever all of us were receiving uh, between seven to 10 hate letters telling us how horrible we were. I didn't realize how hard legislation was and getting things passed until I started getting those letters and we all started talking about it. Um, I am a single dad uh, recently. I've got a two moving up on three year old son. You've probably seen him in a lot of my photos. He uh, started in politics whenever he was two weeks old. He was the first vote on city council uh, for Bonner Springs whenever we got elected. He's my pride and joy. He's got hair even longer than I do. So everybody thinks he's a girl, uh, but we, uh, my uh, uh, son's mother and I are very, um, a very unique parenting partnership, and we wanted to wait until he could literally tell us when he wanted a haircut, and it was actually, it made us both tear up. He asked us, asked us this week, he said, hey, daddy, um, I think I want a haircut now. Um, and, whew, sorry, I always get choked up when I talk about him. Um, like I said, I'm running for house for him. Um, I want to be able to give him an opportunity and know that daddy is willing to fight for him, his rights and his education. And before I ramble on even longer, I'll go ahead and close out with that. But thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate it. Okay. Next we'll move to Kathy Wolfmore. Kathy, your introductory remarks. Thank you, Merle. <clears throat> My name is Kathy Wolfmore and I'm the representative from the 36th district, which is a big part of Western Wyandotte County. And, you know, I say the same thing every time is that I can't tell you what an honor it is, the trust that the voters have placed in me these past 10 years to represent the, their interests. It's probably the greatest professional honor of my life. Um, I also work outside the legislature. I've worked for the past 15 years in healthcare for the University of Kansas Health System as their community liaison. 
And ten, the 10 years before that, I worked as chief of staff for Mayor Carol Murnovich. And I can't tell you how proud I am of all that was accomplished in our community during those 10 years after, and it can, ten, during those 10 years, and it continued on afterwards. You know, I have to tell you that um, I enjoy serving in the legislature, but it's gotten more partisan and more divided over the years. And sometimes it seems as though um, it's more important winning and losing for the various factions than winning for the people that we represent. And I think we're seeing that from the federal level on down. And so a bit of good news, I guess, is that last year I partnered with Representative Stephen Johnson. He's a farmer from Asaria, Kansas. And we introduced the program Building Trust Through Civil Discourse. And we uh, brought in the National Institute for Civil Discourse. They did a training for any legislator that was interested in January, we had a big training day, and then we went on to have programs and speakers throughout the legislative session. And you know, the real point of that program is to allow us to get to know each other on a personal level and have a chance to establish friendships that we might not otherwise take the time or have the opportunity to make. And I think that makes a difference because instead of talking at each other, we're talking to each other. And I think that's the first step towards compromise and getting better legislation. So um, we're very proud of this effort. We had partners from across the state of Kansas helping us with this and hope to continue that program next year. Um, uh, other than that, one of my um, biggest interests in the legislature that I've worked on is mental health and getting expanded services and more resources for the treatment uh, people who deal with mental health issues. Thank you very much, Merle, and I'll pass it on. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to the questions. And uh, the panelists who will be asking the questions, let, let me review that. Mary Rupert with Windout Daily Online. Elnora Excuse Jefferson. Me, Merle, did you get all the candidates? Yeah, did we miss somebody? I thought yeah, there was a couple other candidates. Am I mistaken about that? I don't think so. Is there anybody that I didn't ask for? Is Greg on? Yes. Is Greg I'm on here. Correct. Greg is here. I'm just having video problems with my camera, but I do have audio. And okay, is Greg, it Stan? A, I'm sorry. Yeah, Stan's I'm sorry. here as well. And Stan's a candidate, is he not? Or Yes, he is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so there are two more candidates. I, I just want to be fair. But you're right. Thank you for, for taking. Stan, go ahead and with your, your opening remarks. Hey, I was good not saying anything. Uh, okay. <laughs> I represent, I've been going on my eighth term. I represent the 37th district, I uh, which handles, it goes from about 18th and State Avenue to 74th, gerrymanders down all the way down to County Line. So I've got a pretty good sized district I deal with. Um, I've been the ranking member for the last 10 years and I've been on that committee for uh, commerce, labor, and economic development. I sit on the insurance, financial institutes, and utilities and telecom, which I think all four of them really affect our, my area pretty much. Um, I've been involved in a number of, I guess, negotiations or different things that I feel like I've, at least I got a piece when I couldn't win it. You know, you can't always win it, when you, but I got a little piece in there that made it a little easier to sell, you know, to, to chew on. So, but uh, I'm not going to be as long as everybody else. I've never been that good. So I'm here. Uh, I'm waiting for all wait for the questions. And thank you guys for having this again. It's always good to be here to see everyone. Okay. Thank you. Is uh, Greg Conchola, is, is Greg here? Yes, I am, sir. And I apologize Greg? for the. Okay. Well, I, I apologize for you. Do you have opening remarks, please? Thank you, sir. Um, my name is Greg Conchola. Once again, I apologize for the video problems. I'm not sure what's going on with it, but uh, it just says my camera's occupied, so you're not able to see me, but you can hear me and I can hear you. And I want to thank you for inviting me to this forum. I appreciate it. I'm running for Kansas House District 32. Uh, I was also born at St. Margaret's Hospital, and I uh, have lived in this area my entire life. I currently live in the, uh, the Polish Hill neighborhood in uh, District 32. I am a retired KCK police detective. I spent 25 years with Kansas City, Kansas Police Department 
and two and a half years with the Leawood Police Department prior to uh, coming back home to Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I was the founder of the Kansas City, Kansas Police Athletic League Boxing Club back in 2009, where I opened it at 407 North 6th Street. Um, I'm a former business owner in uh, Strawberry Hill area, and all my children were raised in this area, and we've all, I have two in the military, and uh, two of my brothers were police officers as well. And I appreciate you inviting me here for this forum. And I'll be short. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who's joined us that we haven't included for initial remarks? Okay, we'll move to the questions. And uh, each candidate, the panelists will ask each candidate the same question. And we'll start out with Mary Rupert with the Wyandotte Daily Online. Mary, and you'll first ask questions with Valdine Yuen. Thank you very much. Um, unemployment was over 9% in Wyandotte County in August. And uh, I wanna know if federal funding runs out for extending benefits, would you support the state extending benefits on its own? And what are your priorities also with state funding regarding housing assistance and help for the small businesses to stay open if, if the federal funding is eliminated on these programs? Valdinia, I think your mute is on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. That is a um, significant question because it's very sad that the, the um, partisanship in Washington cannot get that done. But yes, I would support um, the state um, finding the funds. I'm not sure if there are any remaining um, CARES funding, um, but especially for um, rent um, to prevent evictions and also um, provide some relief so that your small businesses can not only reopen, but rehire. And so the, the, um, the pandemic has just wiped out a lot of, of growth but yes, I would support the, the state stepping up and finding the resources to um, boost the, the local communities. Okay. Lewis, your response. Yeah, again, we've had a lot of uh, unemployment in, in Kansas. A lot of it's a service part of the industry that we have in Wyandotte County with the Latino, Hispanic, the black communities who service in these, uh, this demographic. The extension of unemployment benefits, you know, a lot depends on what we get from the federal government. And I remember Governor Laura Kelly stating that it'd be hard for us to continue to service at a level, especially the extra money that uh, the president said uh, without federal funding. So I think uh, right now we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot from the on the federal end to maintain a good, uh, you, you can't, $200 a week or even $600 a week, it's tough to maintain a good style or standard of living. Um, you know, I, I support, uh, you know, looking for funds, trying to ascertain funds. We can't borrow any money, you know, due to the last administration, we found ourselves in a hole that we had to dig out of, and we're still digging out of it. Uh, I, I think that the governor and her staff will do the best they can to help maintain uh, a standard of care for the citizens and the workers of Kansas. Okay. Pam, your remark. Um, okay. Oh, oh, you say Pam, Pam or Dan? Okay, go, <laughs> no, go ahead, Pam. It Pam. was Pam. Um, okay, I agree with, with what the others have stated as well. Um, when I returned from the legislature in March, like from March until probably July, unemployment benefits and then um, help for small businesses to access the um, grants and loans that were being made available were, was probably what I spent a bulk of, of my time helping constituents with. So I think um, we almost have to figure out a way. I mean, we're in 
times that we've never been in before. And we have to figure out a way to help people survive until um, we're able to return to some, you know, some kind of normalcy, whatever that is. And we're all suffering from a lack of just having a nationally coordinated response. I think the governor is doing the best she can with the authority that she has within the state. Um, but we've got to have some additional help from the federal government. Otherwise, our cities and our states are going to be in dire straits. Um, but I'm all for prioritizing and making sure that we're trying to take care of those people who are, are just trying to survive um, um, So with, with their unemployment. So absolutely. Greg Conchola, your response to this question. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I know that the state did receive a significant amount of money from the federal government. Um, what was done with it? I really don't know. Um, I don't know where that money went. I would like to see where it all went because I believe that some of it should have gone to assist with uh, unemployment benefits and also to help the small businesses get back on their feet up and running again. Um, I would support receiving more money from the federal government if it was necessary, but maybe with a better oversight so that it goes to where it's needed and um, I think uh, that's about it. Did I answer all of your questions? Yeah. Okay. okay. Next, we, we go to Tom Burroughs. Tom? Thank you, Merle. Uh, Kansas was granted uh, $1.3 billion by the federal government, which, which came to the, the CARES Committee that one of our members from Wyandotte County serves. And we're, we're very uh, fortunate to have someone serving with the ability to work with local governments. I will share with you that uh, there were two large counties that received direct funding from the federal government, that being Sedgwick County and Johnson County, out of that 1.3 billion. That left uh, a little under uh, 800 million uh, to distribute all across the state. Those monies were divided up and by population size, as well as the impact to the community by COVID. Wyandotte County received, I, I believe, roughly $34 million. And out of that $34 million, it was dispersed to small businesses, education, as, um, and the cities of Bonner Springs, Edwardsville, Kansas City, Kansas, and our local school districts. Those monies were, were sent out to prevent uh, the impact that COVID would have had they not had the ability to finance the purchase of PPE equipment and get those out to the local health to health departments. I will state that uh, I do, do commend uh, Governor Kelly for implementing the uh, EROs that she put in place to prevent evictions by those impacted by COVID. I do wanna personally thank the frontline workers who have put themselves in harm's way under these most trying of, of times during the COVID pandemic. And I believe we're very fortunate to have the quality of Kansans that we have that look out for our interest. I, I stand ready to ensure that any economic development package that would come forward from the federal government and come to the state that would provide job growth and job opportunities, I stand ready to ensure that we can get those monies to our unemployed, underemployed, underinsured uh, people of Kansas. Thank you, Tom. Next, we'll go to Jordan Mackey for his response. Jordan? He'll go last. Thank you, sir. Uh, this has been a passionate issue of mine as being that I'm in construction as well as my family. Um, and this hit me personally. Uh, whenever I was first filed to run, I mean, it was March, I think everything when everything got closed down. Uh, first couple months that I was campaigning and trying to do stuff, I was actually on unemployment. And I was, uh, up until August, I was the Wyandotte County GOP secretary. And one of my goals with being involved in the GOP in Kansas is to be that squeaky wheel. Uh, as Miss Moore related to earlier, um, the partisanship needs to drop. I mean, Wyandotte County matters. That's one thing that we need to really start uh, ringing the bell for. We... We are coming up in the 
in the state more and more. Uh, I was over at Frontier Justice today with some of the um, the U.S. Senate and Congress candidates, and that's one thing that I always hit the pavement running with them, and always giving them a personal text and call is you guys need to be out here, and they're starting to see. Oh, why not County matters? We have a billion dollar row. It's actually two to three billion because of people working across the aisle and working together. And we need to continue that, but we also need to take care of Wyandotte County. It's ridiculous that the majority of individuals in Johnson County or even um, Sedgwick are typically salaried individuals. Uh, I was doing property management with my uncle and a lot of our individuals are hourly or even high paid hourly, and they might be union workers. And if there's furloughs or layoffs, we need to be able to support them. We're the, we're the backbone of Kansas. We have a lot of shipping that comes through here. BNSF was here until moved up to uh, parts of moved to Edgerton. We need to start supporting our whole state, not just the wealthy white areas, but our whole state. I'll finish with that one. Thanks guys. Thank you. Kathy Moore, your response. Thank you, Merle. So I serve on the, I was appointed by Governor Kelly to serve on the SPARC um, task force. And that's the group that um, helps decide how this CARES federal money will be uh, dispersed across the state of Kansas. And as Tom mentioned, a big chunk of that money went to all the counties across Kansas because they know best what the needs of their counties are. Additionally, with the remaining money, we're still we're still in the process of this, but we have already allocated funds to much needed funds to nursing homes. They needed all kinds of personal protective gear and the um, ability to do mass testing for employees and residents. We've given money to um, healthcare, obviously. Um, um, you mentioned um, housing, so rent assistance, but then also if, if someone's no longer occupying your property, we're also offering assistance to landlords because they still have to pay their mortgages. A big part of that went to small businesses. Child care is um, probably one of the more important ones with so many kids home and their parents who can't, who can't stay home and zoom into their job have to go to work. So a big part of that went to um, child care. And then probably really important is more money towards testing because that's the only way we're really going to be able to get a hold of this virus or we're waiting for a vaccine is testing, testing, testing so we can isolate people and that way we can go on with our lives and our businesses to the best of our ability. Okay, thank you. Now we go to Stan Fraunfelter. Stan? Well, go on last, you don't leave a whole lot for someone to say. Uh, I will say we have to be careful, you know, by taking money, I'm all for supporting unemployment, but we got to be careful. If we take that money and move it around with no funds, that, not that much coming in, we need to worry about education. Then, What if they start taking money from it? What about DCF? And we've seen all the problems there. What about your mental health? Like Kathy mentioned, we got to be careful as we move those funds in there. We're not going to have them for other areas, which we need plus Medicaid expansion, which we're going to have to come up with, I think, 15% for that if we do it in the beginning. So I'm not for sure. But I think the reason we're hurt right now, I can think of two times, maybe three in the last 30 years, we went through a recession, which was bad. And just as we're getting on our feet again, we get hit with this. But in that meantime, they took unemployment and gave breaks to the employers when it, instead of leaving it alone. We could have had enough money sitting there to support what we're doing right now had they not reduced it. They did it once in the last 10 years. They did it 10 years prior to that because it builds up. Oh, we have too much. Let's give the employers a break. They don't think ahead for a recession or a pandemic like this when we're going to need it. So we need to make sure that we think more about that and leave something alone and quit taking away from it. That's about all I got. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Elnora Jefferson for her question. Elnora. Thank you, Merle, and thank you to all the candidates who are participating in uh, this afternoon's forum. Um, in light of the ongoing pandemic of racism and police brutality in America, and considering the span of diversity in Wyandotte County, 
the racial, ethnic, and economic diversity that we have. How will you address or how have you addressed already this issue in the Kansas legislature? Okay, we're gonna reverse the order this time and we'll start with Stan. Stan? <laughs> uh, I'd like to go last on this one. Um, you know, we've addressed it already in juvenile justice and in our, uh, uh, the one with all the attorneys, I went brain dead on it, right? They have been dealing with that right now, dealing with the injustice of what we need to take care of. It's our, there are bills. I think if we hadn't been cut short, there were bills sitting in those two committees that could have come out that would have dealt with this. And we would have seen some light before the, before we got through the pandemic. So I believe we are doing our due diligence. We are trying hard in those committees to bring those bills out, but we just got hit short. And I can't speak to the bills. I think Pam will be able to more than me about it because she's on a couple of those committees. Thank you, Stan. Next, we'll go to Kathy Moore. Kathy. Uh, thank you, Merle. So I, I agree with Stan. Um, there is a package to, due to come out on criminal justice reform. The session got um, cut short, that didn't happen. But you know, I want to say something real a positive about Wyandotte County. And I think that um, some of the reasons that it, it hasn't bore it, things, race relations haven't been as difficult as they have maybe in some other communities is some of the things that we have traditionally um, done in Wyandotte County. You know, I'll give credit for, um, it seems like the minority community has a very good relationship and very good leadership and they are a good bridge to law enforcement. In addition, additionally, I think that the training that the um, law enforcement gets in terms of, um, for example, CIT training, that's crisis intervention training, Wyandotte County trains every single law enforcement officer. And that is a training that, although it was it was designed more for dealing with mental health issues they run into in their daily work so that those, those patients don't end up in the jail, they end up getting treatment. What it really is, is de-escalation techniques that they're learning. So I think that Wyandotte County going all in on this crisis intervention training probably has made a big difference in our community. Um, and also, we have been a leader in community policing since the 90s. And the philosophy of community policing is don't wait for the service call, get ahead of the pro problem and try and solve it before it escalates into something dangerous. Not that we don't have a lot of work to do um, in this area, but I just wanted to mention those very positive things. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move to Jordan Mackey. Your response, Jordan. May I get a reiteration of the question? I apologize. I had uh, emails and goofy stuff popping up and it bleeped out my audio whenever I was okay. listening to your question. Elnora, could you repeat your question, please? Sure. For yes, Jordan? I can. Sure. Uh, in the light of the ongoing pandemic of racism and police brutality in America, and considering the span of diversity in Wyandotte County, the racial, ethnic, and economic diversity, how will you address or how has it been addressed in the Kansas legislature? Uh, I haven't been in the legislature yet, so uh, I will speak on behalf of being a city councilman. Uh, we voted in um, before it was even cool and before there was any uh, news about it. We had body cameras for our officers before anything even happened. And then whenever, uh, that was actually, it was a couple months before I was sworn in, a couple months after that, we even upped it another level and we added body cam or we added cameras to our car and we synced the two cameras as well as we have encouraged through funding and uh, just outreach that our officers are not police officers, but peace officers. Our officers go in the community and they're part of the community uh, they go to the coffee shop, they go to the school, they're out everywhere that can be seen, and they help the children, they'll do events at the fire station, wherever. Uh, we are getting away from the uh, overarching patriarchy style, like beat down thing, and we have peace officers in Bonner. 
Um, I haven't worked in Wyandotte County uh, per se, but I'm sure that, or I, I mean, I've seen that with a lot of the officers. There's a lot of KCK officers that work in, uh, or not work, but live in Bonner Springs. And that's what I'm hearing as well, is that Wyandotte County is doing a great job about that. They've been proactive and we were doing it before it was national news. Greg Conchola. Greg, your your answer to this question. Hi, thank you. Um, having served in law enforcement for over 27 years, I would say that our Kansas City, Kansas Police Department and the Wyandotte County Sheriff does do an excellent job. Uh, we receive the training on an annual basis, uh, updated training um, for uh, community policing, how to interact with, with our community, how to uh, handle difficult situations, uh, both professionally and safely. And we have some of the best training in the nation, if you ask me. And like like uh, the others have pointed out, Kansas City, Kansas doesn't seem to have the problems that the um, rest of the large cities are having right now because we are well-trained. And I think that in order to keep that, we need to keep make sure that the police departments and all of our law enforcement agencies have adequate funding in order to continue that training. I, th I, I would say prevention is much is a much better bet than uh, a retro a reaction. Next, we'll go to uh, Pam Curtis. Pam. Thank you, Merle. Um, and thank you, Elnora, for the question. Um, so just to build on what others have said, I, I think that truly KCK, we have benefited from having um, good community policing. We all know that crime is solved best when it's done as a partnership between the police, uh, law enforcement, um, and the community. So I think definitely um, KCK has, has benefited um, you know, from that. Not that we don't have room to improve, we certainly do. Um, and that's something that we should always be open to. Um, I think there are some exciting reforms coming forward. Um, as was mentioned, we had a short session last year. Some of these things probably would have moved forward last session, but um, because of COVID, we um, just had to refocus our attention. But um, definitely the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, they've been meeting and their set of recommendations should be coming forward um, this coming session. I think it's going to be kind of a comprehensive um, criminal justice reform recommendation package. And there are also some other kind of low hanging fruit um, that people are introducing individual bills on as well. Um, we also will have the civil asset forfeiture um, report. Um, we had hoped last year to take action on that, but that report was not ready. It will be ready this year. This year, we could have legislation that would deal with the civil asset forfeiture um, issue. Um, one bill that I worked with Healthy Communities Wyandotte on last year was the civil or was the um, auto expungement bill, um, removing a barrier to felons um, when they leave prison. A lot of times, they have to continue marking that box on their job applications, um, and they're eligible for expungement, but they don't have the $2,000 that it costs to go hire an attorney to get that expunged. This would just automatically take that off so that it would remove that barrier to employment. Um, so those are some things that are, um, I, hopefully that we'll be, have a chance to uh, work on this coming year. Um, but I think definitely the, um, the climate is right, the environment's right. Um, I think there is definitely a mood that we really want to make some headway on criminal justice reform this year. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to Lewis Rees. Lewis. Thank you, uh, Merle. I appreciate that question, especially right now. Uh, what's going on in, in the community and other community we see around? It can't happen in Kansas City, Kansas. We're, we're not immune to things like that happening, especially when it comes to violence and the police being involved. Just two weeks ago, down the street from my mom's house, I had a 15-year-old Latino boy get shot and killed. Uh, just right there, just a little bit southwest uh, of 43rd and Rainbow. Uh, 
Uh, Harmon High School has been hit hard with uh, shootings and death for the, of our young people. The communication and awareness that I tried, that we should establish in, in Kansas City, Kansas, as we try to uh, spearhead initiatives that can be an example of, for surrounding areas. You know, we're mostly surrounded Westwood, Leewood, Mission, Shawnee, all predominantly white neighborhoods. We, even though we're blessed with diversity, it's also can be a burden. And as a Latino growing up in Wyandotte County, I saw things firsthand happen uh, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, my son growing up in Wyandotte County, my family, I tried to establish with, uh, we had, we, every year we have a uh, legislators meeting with the uh, UG. And I was talking to them about establishing a liaison between the Latino community and the law enforcement agencies of Wyandotte County because of all the violence we're seeing around Central Avenue, around J.C. Harmon, over off Maple Hill, different areas and in the black communities, a violence amongst themselves. You know, why are these things happening? Right now, tensions are high, uh, tempers are flaring. We need to uh, go back to like Kansas as a mental health uh, in our areas. I established a mental health caucus for the House, for those of legislators who aren't on health committees to be involved and communicate. And that has a lot to do with what's going on and the tempo and the climate of anger, of uh, discouragement, of doubt, of being people not trusting the government. So we, we have something we have to face head on. Hopefully we'll have a longer legislative session this next year so we can uh, get involved with some of those issues and maybe circumvent some of these things happening. Thank you. Now we'll move to Valdinia Wynn. Valdinia? Right, thank you. And, you know, all of us have addressed the issue um, I, I hear a common theme of community engagement. And so we know that um, we have to um, get our community members engaged with law enforcement. Um, dialogue has to, has to open. It, it is not there in the community relations that I see. Um, as far as what I have done, when the George Floyd um, incident took place um, on behalf of the Quad Caucus, which is African American, Latino American, Native American, and Asian American. We submitted a statement to the House condemning the action. And we had um, many of us signed on to two pieces of legislation that, again, the politics of the, the House leadership were not um, recorded until like the day before we, we adjourned. Uh, the, you know, Pam mentions civil asset forfeiture. Uh, that, that issue has, has um, ramifications as far as, especially with our local law enforcement who come to Topeka and testify that they do um, take the assets. So there, there are a lot of issues that uh, the state can address. I, I believe our Wyandotte County delegation will um, support uh, the fair hearing and the the um, resolution that is that is needed. But you realize that a lot of the policies will govern other law enforcement agencies, and and they may or may not be willing to open dialogue to address the issue. Uh, the last day of the session, we did have um, one of our members, as well as um, the the other party member, um, publicly, you know, state that we've got to open dialogue. So um, we're there, and we know the importance and the significance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we will move to our third panelist, JD Rios, and his question for the candidate, JD. Okay, thank you, Merle. And again, I appreciate the candidates uh, being here to answer uh, questions. Uh, I have a uh, two-part question, so uh, uh, please bear, bear with me. During last year's session, Community Care, the Kansas Hospital Association, and the Kansas Pharmacist Association that advocated to ban Pharmacy benefit managers, commonly called PBMs, and others from 
treating 340B covered entities differently from other pharmacies. This legislation did not pass. Without such a law, discriminatory pricing reduces services community health centers can provide to low income and uninsured patients. Would you support a ban on disparate contracting prices? Also in last year's session, flexibilities were passed allowing telehealth rules governing medical, dental, and behavioral health uh, services. This will expire in mid-January. Do you believe the state's telehealth rules should be permanently changed? Okay. And we'll start with, with Valdinia Wynn. Valdinia? Well, thank you. And honestly, I will have to say I'm not was not familiar with that legislation, but any legislation that would prohibit um, fairness in pricing is is wrong. As well as the second, um, there were some. I I am familiar with with some of the telehealth medicine uh, regulations, but uh, it never did come to. Um, a committee that I serve on. And so uh, being honest and fully transparent, I don't, um, I don't know enough about the legislation to, to actually give an honest um, answer. But my answer would be, of course, I would not support um, price gouging, especially for, for vulnerable. Uh, and that's another reason Medicaid uh, needs to be expanded. And then um, we're going to have to deal with telehealth medicine because in this environment, that's the only way um, service is going to be delivered. So um, thank you for the question. And I will make sure to look for uh, that, that type of legislation. Okay. Louis Reese, your response. Thank you. Uh, again, that uh, the first part of the question, John, didn't come into any committee I was on, but my wife being a doctor, the variance of policies that uh, pharmacists have have to be uniform. And a lot of the prices that are, are gauged are by insurance companies, what they'll cover, what they won't cover. You know, uh, we as a state now, we have CVS Caremark. If you're state insured, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they'll cover some things. Then again, they won't. So. I, I'm happy to say, or I'm not happy to say, I'm at the age where I get Medicare, where I can go to a secondary insurance. But not everybody has that option. So a uniformity with uh, with restrictions and putting a, a ceilings on what they can be charged from, from pharmacy to pharmacy, based on what the pharmaceutical companies feel the market would bear, I would support that. And on the next part of a tele, tele uh, help, my wife right now treats her patients because of the COVID by zoom and by phone she's a psychiatrist so you know it's a safeguard for her and everything's done by computer she can fill meds she can uh, you know call people back uh, make sure that she sees their face she can't touch them but, you know even though that she's dealing with the mind she can tell by a lot of your body how you're responding mentally you know you can't heal the mind before you can you can have to heal the body it has to be a, a congruent effort uh, but yeah i would support telehealth even longer than the, the COVID, you know, what the restrictions are is COVID because just sometimes people have a hard time. If you're in, in rural Kansas, getting to a, a doctor who, unless you have a broken bone or need surgery, yeah, I think it, it helps quite a bit. Pam Curtis, your response. Uh, thank you. Um, and JD, I have to admit that I'm not real familiar specifically, but I would definitely support any measure that would um, help prevent discriminatory, discriminatory pricing. So um, definitely let me know if that issue comes forward um, again. Um, and then as far as telehealth, I am totally supportive of expanding telehealth. Um, 
but we first have to have broadband. You can't have telehealth without broadband. <laughs> so as you all know, I've been a huge proponent of broadband um, expansion, and I'm so glad that we are making those investments now um, and building those partnerships so that more people will have access to broadband, and that will make things like telehealth even more feasible. So thank you so much for that question. Okay. Greg Conchola, your response. Thank you. Um, I am not familiar with the bill that uh, you're talking about, Mr. Rios, uh, so I will have to plead ignorance on that, but I will say that I would like to see it, and um, I certainly would oppose any price gouging or any difference in um, pricing for medications for anyone, for all of our Kansans. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the second part of the question, again, I'm not familiar with that either. Um, I would like to take a good look and I'm not sure what you're referring to as, um, as, um, the difference between what one pharmacy charges and what another charges. I don't know if that's just, uh, something that's competitive or, or if it's something that, that really needs to be addressed. Um, I'm really not sure what the situation is. So I'm sorry to, to say that I, it would be difficult for me to answer that question one way or the other. Tom Burroughs, your response. Thank you, Merle. Uh, any discriminatory actions that prevent people from getting proper medical attention and or drug prescriptions is wrong. And just to have to change a formulary to meet the criteria within the 304B uh, through Medicaid is, is wrong. A lot of times the formulary is specifically prescribed to a patient for a reason to prevent any side effects or any ill effects that may occur from changing medications. And so I, I would be opposed to, uh, I mean, I'd be opposed to any discriminatory action. I want to get to the broadband aspect. You know, this, this goes right along with Medicaid expansion. And a number of the people have already uh, brought it to the attention that we see through Zoom, if we've learned anything from COVID, not everyone has a good uh, internet connection. And so if you're in a rural, underserved, uninsured area that is weak in uh, fiber and or uh, technology, then what, what you're dealing with is the inability to seek proper medical care. We have to, we have to increase the backbone of our inter, uh, internet technology across the state. That comes with a extension and continued growth of uh, our uh, internet connectivity across the state. Plus, we need to be mindful that through Medicaid expansion, we are addressing some of the needs in the rural communities more than we are in the urban core. Those in the urban core have transportation to and from uh, medical attention. I, I remember, I think it was five or six years ago, we started discussing the who was going to pay it was there going to be the point of contact from the doctor or was it going to be from the point of contact with the referral as to who was going to pay for that visit? Bottom line is they weren't thinking of the patient. They were thinking about the dollars involved. I'm all for ex uh, expansion of telemedicine. I truly believe if COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's that we need connectivity all across the state for all points of business. Thank you. Jordan Mackey, your response. Mr. Rios, thank you for bringing that up. As a, as a, uh, uh, I guess I'm not the family member that has diabetes, but on my father's side, uh, my aunt, um, and actually her daughter and her son, or yeah, there's I've got three generations that are all diabetics, um, and I want to touch on that. I'm very big on that, as well as being a single dad. Um, I get the Medicaid part. Uh, my son, whenever we take him to the doctor, we have to take him up to Leavenworth because nobody around here will accept our insurance that I'm aware of. Um, and all of those hit home personally for me. Uh, with mental health being a big thing in my family, my brother committed suicide in 2014. We need to be able to get people psychological help as well as be able to get their meds and make it affordable. We could have a lot of people out of jail and we would have a lot less policing and a lot less problems if we had people that had proper medical care and proper assistance through either telemedicine. And as uh, Ms. Curtis brought up, I used to live in Waldo 
And Waldo was one of the first areas to be able to get the Google Wi-Fi, or not Google Wi-Fi, but the Google Fiber. Um, and I moved back to Bonner, and uh, Spectrum or whatever the thing was would sit there and try to tell me how great their internet was, and it doesn't work. I'm literally on this Zoom call now, and as I've done council meetings and everything during COVID, I've had to use my Sprint uh, cell phone and had to buy another cell phone to be able to have enough data just to be able to operate and do my job and do my duties. That's ridiculous. I mean, as I said, we've got BNSF, we've got uh, all, basically all major highways go through Wyandotte County. Why can't we have things like connectivity? Those will help with mental health as well as the schools. And as I've mentioned before, that's one of the reasons why I get in arguments with some of my GOP folk is because there is a fine balance between um, government and individuals, and we need to start reaching out to areas like Wyandotte County. We need to start supporting our own, and we need to start standing up and saying, hey, we matter as well. We can do just as well if we have the same options. I know I didn't answer your question exactly, Mr. Rios, so I apologize, uh, but I would need to do a much greater research on it to be able to articulate it as well as I would, uh, as I owe to you. Kathy Moore, your response. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for the question. So the 340B program was passed, I think, in the 90s by Congress. And what it does is it um, requires drug manufacturers to um, provide a discounted rate for their drugs to um, qualifying healthcare organizations. And they to qualify, you have to be an organization that um it takes a lot of medicaid patients or uninsured patients so it's kind of a reward for taking those patients that don't have um the typical insurance that that pays so that is just a crucial program for healthcare organizations especially those where the um, vast majority of their patients are uninsured or on medicaid so it's just crucial that that is um fairly dealt with. Um, as far as telehealth, I think everything's been said, but telehealth visits have increased um, quite a bit during this pandemic for obvious reasons. And I think along with um, accessibility, more accessibility to telehealth, I think the number one thing that this pandemic has pointed out in, in terms of healthcare coverage is that we desperately need to pass Medicaid expansion and Medicaid expansion, although um, traditionally you think it of as co covering the working poor, it would have been wonderful to have it in the middle of this pandemic because many people who lost their jobs and then lost their health insurance might qualify for Medicaid expansion and at least, at least they would have health care while they're looking for another job or getting through this pandemic the best they can. Okay, Stan, your response. It was in my committee, so uh, it didn't even get out of committee. It was discussed, but your, I don't mind saying it, Farm Bureau stopped it. Just like they brought up a bit, just like they brought a bill that we passed out of there that would give anybody they wanted, if you had a pre existing condition, if you're older, they can pick and choose what they want, which means a lot of your elderly or pre-existing conditions will be in the one pot, which is a lot higher insurance and earn take all the good people until they get older, then they'll drop them. So that came out of committee, but this didn't. As far as the tell them, yeah, we need that. I mean, that's all we got. When you look at 80% of our population is in roughly 20 counties, you're looking at a lot of area that doesn't have that ability to, for healthcare out there. So telemarketing is all they got. We did pass a nurses compact that helped them a little bit. At least they have some sort of health care going there, but I mean from around the area, but we don't have we don't have the ability, they don't have the ability to do a lot of things. Now the one thing they did do, I did they did do is they gave a chiropractor the ability to okay a young man to go back and play football if he had a concussion. Now we're now we're stretching it. I'd rather see telemedicine in there than having someone that really isn't qualified to make that decision, put a kid back in the game could definitely hurt him for life. So that's where I think it would make a big difference there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll 
move to Mary Rupert for her next question. Mary. Um, thank you very much. Uh, should uh, efforts to achieve and maintain equity in school funding in Kansas be continued, even though the state could be facing some financial challenges in the future? And what would you do if funding for K-12 schools is short next year? And we'll start with Stan. It figures. And then your uh, response. That's, that's a tough one because you know what they, during the Brownback administration, we almost got it completely and we're just getting back on our feet uh, and funding it like it would properly, what like probably should be. Like I said earlier in the, in my statement, I mean, there's going to be a lot of needs out there and only so much money to go around. Now here's some of the answers we could do. This would be a great time at least to put medical marijuana on the ballot and pass it. There's a funding there. We also had the ability to put, I mean, it's a, it's a user deal, but it's sports betting. We didn't do it. I mean, there's a lot of things out there that if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But if you want to, you have the ability to. I mean, those are funds out there that we could be reaching out to right now that could help us through this time period that we should have done last time. But as far as education, like I said, Medicaid expansion, education, hoping our DCF and our mental health, I mean, those are four of my priorities. I mean, that I'd have to look into other than my wish list to Santa Claus is a livable wage. I mean, we got it. There's no minimum wage anymore. Everybody's working full time. There's no such thing as it. We need a livable wage or a prevailing wage back. Um, you know, that would help us right there because if people are making more money, they get off the state's assistance. And that's the whole key to it. So you got to, you've got people out there working, making that kind of wage. They don't, they will be paying more taxes and we don't have the system anymore. That's my thought. Thank you. Kathy, your response. Um, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> that's a great question, Mary, because I serve on the Appropriations Committee and we're going to be faced with nothing but tough decisions because of the pandemic. <clears throat> Obviously, we haven't been taking in the revenues that we had finally turned the state around and we're getting back to funding some of the things that had been shorted for years. So we're every, everything's going to be a tough decision. However, we have finally fully funded our schools, um, which was so necessary and so needed. So I can't imagine that we wouldn't continue at the um, present level. At least that would be my wish. But I, I think people just have to be prepared and realistic that it's going to be all tough decisions this year due to the revenues we've lost. Now it is picking up a bit and it is a little better than we thought it might be right now, but still there's probably going to be significant cuts in, in different services because of, because of the COVID, COVID's effect on our economy. Jordan, your response. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is an, another issue that literally personally hits home for me. I've got a uh, two year old, he'll be three in December. And this is a very, very big worry of mine. Um, we've already started trying to do our own kind of preschooling stuff because of COVID and things like that. Uh, but I'm leaning more and more towards being a proponent of uh, school choice because I'm blessed to be in Bonner Springs, Kansas, or I mean Bonner Springs in Wyandotte, but I know that a lot of people aren't. And I mean, up in the Piper area, yeah, those schools are rated really well. And it goes back to, you can break it down to the race issues. It sucks because as somebody mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I believe Lewis mentioned it, we're surrounded by a lot of predominantly and statistically white areas, white and wealthy. I, I mean, we're one of the more poorest counties next to the literally the wealthiest county in the entire state. And we need help. I mean, it, it's ridiculous that you can hop over the border and get a school that's rated uh, eight, nine, 10. And yeah, whenever your parents are living a four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar house and they're making a uh, hundred thousand apiece, it's a lot easier to have options. Whenever you're a single parent like myself and uh, my son's mom were doing gig jobs or trying to figure out just how to put food on the table or how to keep her lights on, we don't have the extra time to sit there and help students through, or like even 
my worry is helping my son or get tutors or send them to special things. We're worried about trying to survive. Uh, we, the, the issue of the equity and equality, um, why not does why not deserves more? I mean, we do a lot for the state and we need a couple of squeaky wheels. And as I mentioned, I, I'm adamantly against the uh, partisanship that keeps getting crap down on our community because uh, Wyandotte has been predominantly Democratic uh, since 1976, but we've got to start working together. Um, I'll, I'll beat that to a dead horse. I, as I said, I am GOP and I'm on a lot of the committees and, and uh, stuff throughout Johnson County. That's one thing that I bring up and it's starting to make an impact. People are starting to listen to us and they're wanting to help. I'll go ahead and hop off my diatribe. Tom Burroughs, your response. Well, serving on appropriations, as Kathy stated, we are going to have some tremendous budget challenges, but we have a governor, Governor Kelly, who is very uh, efficient in how she manages her budget. She has tremendous experience in dealing with budgets. And those of us that have been on the budget committee for a while know the struggle that we had in funding, getting funding back for education. Under the prior administration, the self-imposed recession that we experienced under the Brownback uh, tax plan pretty near gutted uh, our education community. I would be absolutely opposed to taking any money away from education. I truly believe that the progress that we've made deals with a lot of the social issues that have been discussed here. The, the one that Elnora asked, uh, the comment I would have made was that we need to continue to ensure that our children have access to quality education. And we have to have access, we have to create access to economic uh, equality here in this community. Wyandotte County residents first, when we have these businesses come in and want to do business within Wyandotte County. And that education goes right on in line with our local community colleges. There needs to be a seamless process that our children continue to get the education necessary to meet these, uh, the new century qualifications needed for these high tech jobs. I believe our kids are just as bright, just as smart, no matter what zip code, what social economic opportunities they come from, they just need the opportunity. We in the Kansas legislature, those of us from Wyandotte County that come from a very diverse community have fought tirelessly over the years to ensure funding for education is kept in place. I met today with our Bonner Springs School Superintendent to ensure that we have the amount of teachers necessary under this COVID. And we are still needing uh, special education teachers, teachers that in a special field that have gone into the private uh, industry because education was gutted in Kansas. So we still have the shortage of teachers and that we need to continue to ensure that we as a legislative body communicate to our education partners that we strongly support funding fair and equitably our education system in Kansas. Thank you, Tom. Now we'll move to Greg Conchola for your remarks. Greg. Thank you, sir. And uh, I was, you know, looking at what Kansans pay in income tax. 51.1% of all the income tax that Kansans pay goes towards education. And the state general fund expenditures, 62.9% of all the state general fund expenditures goes to education. But yet our schools are receiving a low D rating. Why is that? I think we, we would make better sense of uh, maybe appropriating that money within the school system to where it needs to be so that our children's education is not what suffers. Um, you know, it's it's going to be tough to make cuts like everyone else says. 26.3% of general fund goes to human services. Only 4.4% goes to general government. And for agriculture and resources, we're, they're only getting 0.2% of all the expenditures from the state general fund. Public safety, only 6%. So it is going to be tough. And I know that education, uh, that number is locked in there for a couple of years anyway, for the next couple of years. So they are going to be adequately funded. It's just, I think that these school systems need to do a better job of using that money. Thank you. Pam Curtis, your response. Thank you, Merle, and thank you for the question. Um, I, 
you know, we work so hard to get um, out from under the courts on our funding for public education. And um, I definitely think that our commitment should be that we try to um, at least maintain the level of funding that's needed that we, you know, keep out of the court system again. Um, you know, there's a lot of components to um, school funding and there's, you know, we all know that our schools are not necessarily equal, but this, the state's attempt to at least try to equalize the funding to give everybody a level playing field, but it only takes one visit. I know my, my son went to Sumner Academy and one visit to a school to our South um, and to see, you know, the kind of facilities that they have that look almost like college facilities. So, you know, that education, and it has been that way for a long time. My husband who uh, went to Wyandotte High School in his senior year transferred to Shawnee Mission North. He said he was amazed when he got there. At Wyandotte, it was one microscope to every five students. And when he got to Shawnee Mission North, he was amazed because he had his own microscope in science class and how much more he could learn. And so um, there's a lot of components. There's not only the state funding, but there's also the local funding that goes into that component. And um, I think, you know, we need to make sure that that too plays into the whole equalization because there are some counties that have the ability to raise a whole lot more money through their local option budget. Um, and they want to hold on to more of that money. And my thought is we're as a state, we're all in this together. We all need to participate and this is our future. We, we need to make these critical investments and we even need to start earlier. We need to start educating children before kindergarten because that is when their brains are mostly developing. Um, we are losing a huge opportunity. And it, we have shown that the return on investment by investing in early childhood education the return on investment to the state is tremendous because you have fewer people going to prison. You have more that as they advance through the education system that they have jobs that are paying livable wages. They, you have fewer people on public assistance. There is just a tremendous advantage for making those early investments. And we cannot not invest in education. It's just too important for our state. Thank you so much for the question. I appreciate it. Lewis Reese, your response. Having an equitable school system and education funding is has to be paramount for our state and our growth. We have to invest in our youth more than almost any resource. Somebody brought up the word resource. That's a strong word. You know, especially in Wyandotte County when we have ESL, ELL, uh, Spanish speakers. You know, why should we assume that they're going to be at a handicap because we don't have the funding to help them attain a good education? That's just wrong. Years ago, uh, there was people that came up from Mexico, and I remember they were talking to my sister about this, that their kids were put in special classes because they couldn't speak the language. That was wrong. And who was to blame for that? It was, I would blame the legislature back then for not making sure that equitable funding was was appropriate for each each person or people that children that came up from different parts of the world that we maintained a good school system that gave them an equal chance to compete our kids are having a hard time competing so what do we do do we want to pull funding representative burroughs brought back the bound the brownback administration we had to fight for funding and we came out on the short end on some of those issues so the strength of our state the strength of our school systems and the strength of the economy as we grow to draw businesses to draw families in has to be schools in a school system. Okay. Thank you. Valdenia, your response. Thank you. And all have noted the significance, the importance um, that education is economic development for our state and the future. And as well, the question spoke to primarily K through 12, but as in the responses, higher education funding is, is not adequate. Um, early childhood is, is not adequate. 
um, our the, the capacity that we need to fund for early childhood just in one day county is is must, must be addressed but to answer the question um, as the ranking member on the k-12 education budget committee many times uh, I and a couple of my other colleagues of, of Democratic Party are the only ones that are are standing up fighting for those, um, the funding for, for at risk, the funding for special ed, while special ed is federally mandated. But at the end of the day, as already been mentioned, our governor has made a commitment to public education and its funding. Although if the, the resources are not there, the revenue is not there, we have to remember that the Supreme Court retained jurisdiction. So if the courts do not intervene, um, however the, the level of funding that, that we appropriate, then understandably it is, is how it's spent in each school district. And so you have to be, we have to be very careful and, and, and make sure it is, it's adequate and equitable. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Elnora Jefferson. Elnora. Thank you very much, Merle. The uh, Northeast Area Master Plan is a two-year-old uh, plan. It is a product uh, of an area uh, that has uh, wanted and desired and needed um, hope and economic community and human development. It's an area, however, where big time development like what we see out west and what is to come at the Schlitterbaum and urban outfitters and so forth. The Northeast Area Master Plan is not an area for various reasons that is chosen for that big time development. In addition, financial tools such as SMID, IBRs, star bonds do not find the Northeast as a good fit. My question is how can we use these tools that are fit for other areas, that's a good fit for other areas, to address the community needs within the Northeast Area Master Plan, like for a grocery store, like for a heritage trail with the education and the learning possibilities of that, like with housing and block development, and even broadband. We've talked about broadband in rural communities. We also have a void of broadband, if you will, in the urban areas. With something like community benefit agreements, a tag along on those types of developments be satisfactory so that a portion of whatever is used, whether it's the proceeds or, or whatever is used on there, to be used in order to fund these, these areas in the master plan. I'm sorry, I know it's a long question. I'm just trying to, to phrase it and to put a visualization out there. And if you need for me to repeat it, I'll, I'll try to do so in shorter words. Thank you. Valdenia, we'll start with your response. Sure, I'd be happy to. And thank you, Ms. Jefferson. And we have worked together for a long time in trying to advance um, all of Wyandotte County, but also when we talk about equity, it has not been uh, recognized, promoted, um, advance, whatever word I want to choose. I would first say that, yeah, there are state tools. Star bonds, just ones you mentioned. Um, but in my opinion, the local elected elite leaders have not um, accepted the, the importance of uh, promoting development. Um, and you don't want to hear a, a, a 30 year uh, discourse, but the, the rhetoric, and I'll call it rhetoric of, oh, you always have to have rooftops before we bring in development, but it doesn't happen like that in other areas. And so um, I would say we would have as state leaders, we would need to work a little bit closer, not a little bit, a lot closer with local leaders to um, encourage uh, the use of these state tools to bring development that is long overdue in the Eastern uh, Corridor. Thank you. 
Lewis Reese, your response. I agree with, with Val and what she says about using state tools. You know, the draw and prioritizing the redevelopment of some of the areas there, beautiful. Uh, the Quindaro historic area around there by the river. Uh, I took a bus tour out of KU Medical Center there a couple years ago and was astounded by <laughs> what was there and the neglect that was there. Uh, Self-sufficient, self-maintained uh, commerce and revenue uh, stemming uh, businesses need to come into there and, and how do we prioritize that? What, how do we do development there? I'm looking at the Argentine area uh, in my district. We finally got a grocery store there a few years back. And that store's moved, but now we also have a police department down there in the area. And there's a grocery store that's now, it's a Mexican or they call it Latinx now, that's self-maintained, self-developed. And that's the one, the main area store that people go to now. You know, how do we transform the Northeast into a good working development area that's that we that's safe for people to go that people feel comfortable i think it's working with state and using state tools uh, and, and elaborating and making uh, sure that we talk with the ug on some of those issues is paramount pam curtis your response um thank you and thank you elnor for the for the question um you know there's just so much potential and and in the northeast area um you know, it has two of our most historic sites in the whole state, the Quindaro Ruins, um, you know, the Western University, all the rich history that's there. And then if you follow the river on around, you know, we have Call Point where Lewis and Clark camped. I, you know, we've got a beautiful riverfront. If you've been down there to the Juniper Gardens, um, you know, to the farm down there, I mean, it is, it's just gorgeous. So there's, I just have to think that it's um, its potential just has not been discovered yet. And, um, I, you know, I agree with everything everybody said, there's state incentives, there's state tools, you know, um, perhaps it's just an awareness, making sure that some of our Department of Commerce people are aware of what potential there is down there. Um, and, and maybe just getting it on their radar could help, you know, maybe seed, you know, the idea of some great development happening. Um, I, I hear rumblings of some riverfront development, so I'm hopeful. We are seeing more development downtown now, um, uh, you know, with the Merck and, and then with the redevelopment that's proposed there at the Reardon Center. So um, definitely, um, you know, hope that that continues to move northward. But any ideas that you might have, you know, I'm on the Commerce, Labor, and Economic Development Committee with, with Tom and Lewis and Stan. And, and um, if, if you are aware of any, you know, tool that we could consider legislatively, um, I would be happy, um, you know, to, to talk with you and work with you on that. So, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Greg Conchola, your response. Well, I have to agree with Valdina. Uh, on saying that the, the Northeast area is long overdue for an overhaul to make it uh, uh, to attract businesses there and uh, to make it more uh, lively, more profitable for the residents in the area that, to live and work in there. But it does, it does fall on the, uh, the local government to make that attraction to, in order to attract private businesses to invest in, in there. And uh, Representative Reese also hit uh, on, on something that I agree with also, that uh, in order to attract businesses to invest in a neighborhood or in an area, it has to be safe. Uh, that's where our community partners with, uh, with the police department and the residents fall in line right there, is, is, to, is to make that area a safer place to put a business so that you know, more private developers would be more inclined to spend the money there. Tom Burroughs, <clears throat> your response. Well, thank you, Elnora. That, that downtown master plan, the Northeast master plan is one that was put together by a large number of individuals out of the Northeast. And having grown up in at 13th and Quindaro going to Bryant School, when I was a young man, I've, I've seen the impact that decay has had to continued growth through that area. 
but I also believe there are things happening that will feed into the Northeast Master Plan. The Willie Lanier project that Pam brushed on in reference to the Reardon Center, the, the Merck is just was a grocery store that came about from discussion from those within the Northeast community. Some of the challenge with the Northeast community is the aggregate of land mass, trying to pull together a large enough land mass to bring a project of significance in. You mentioned the Schlitterbahn, you mentioned uh, uh, out West, there was large property masses out there. We don't have that luxury, but we do have large industrial base in Wyandotte County that should be utilizing the, uh, if the, their employees should come from Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. And so when we put incentives on the table, if they want to build in the Northeast Master Plan, they should partner with our local school district, our local community college, and our local Department of Commerce to ensure that Wyandotte County residents are hired first as those incentives go out. If they don't make those incentives criteria, then those dollars should be returned to the state. As a uh, member of the Economic Development Committee, I'm very familiar with the incentives that bring economic development to this community. And we work tirelessly to ensure that all areas of our community are represented. You have a new service area that went in at 32nd and uh, Brown, I believe, or Leavenworth Road. And you also have, it was mentioned, the federal government has now recognized the Quindaro Ruins as a national landmark. And we're starting to see the work on the core around the call point and part of the levy. We hope to be able to bring all of those entities together our faith-based community from the Northeast end are strong advocates for continued growth. And we stand ready as a legislative body to do whatever we can to help that growth and the future of the Northeast to, to be vibrant and to be viable. Jordan Mackey, your response. Thrilled, I love this one, thank you. I was actually waiting for this type of question. Uh, my parents bought their first house in Quindaro and then moved to Edwardsville, and then eventually Bonner Springs. Uh, and they were in Quindaro um, with a whole group of individuals. And what it honestly comes down to is I have no problem saying it. I think it's really amusing to bring it up. Everybody pretends like it's this big secret. It's racism. It's freaking racism, and it's partisanship. I applied uh, three years ago for the economic development uh, position for Wyandotte County. I wasn't even considered because of the party that I was registered for. They had written my uh, denial letter before I even uh, went to the interview for the job. It, it was ridiculous. And it's like, yes, I'm a Republican. But one of the things that I keep hearing from people, I mean, I've traveled all over the state uh, when I was the Wyandotte secretary for the GOP, down in Wichita and all over Johnson County, Mission Hills, all of that stuff. Uh, people are willing to help but they are afraid of the stupid partisanship crap. And I'm just sick of it. The Democratic Party or the worried about the Black Hood or the Mexicans or whatever. I grew up in those areas. My uncle owned an, a vacuum cleaner shop for uh, 30 years at, at 18th and Central. Uh, the house that I was talking about over in Waldo, I was at 71st and Troost. I love the area. I had no problem with it. Like I said, my parents bought their first house in Quindaro. We got to break down these barriers. And we've got to break them down with a freaking sledgehammer if we have to. It's ridiculous. The only reason that that area is not being built up is because it's predominantly black. And I have no problem saying it. it's ridiculous. What we do, we, I could start from day one, get on whatever committee or whatever special thing and go in there. You go in and you find alphas. Uh, for 15 years, I've made a career out of um, basically anthropology or the study of humans and how they interact. And different things like that. That's why I lived in the Troost area. That's why, uh, like the different areas that I bounced around and lived in in my life, I don't have a problem with areas. You just got to learn people. You got to go into a community. You got to find the alphas, and you've got to empower them. It doesn't matter if they're black, white, Mexican, purple, brown, or purple people leaders. You find the alphas, and you empower them. You go in and you empower the churches. You empower them because it's the faith and family aspect. It, find wealthy white folk in mission hills and say hey i've got a dude in quindaro that wants to uh open a an ice cream shop i was leaving the courthouse the other day and i went and i saw a trump flag on a, a sixplex right behind the courthouse and i was amused i was laughing out loud in my car i went right up to him and there was a couple that was sitting out on their porch i said guys i i gotta know i'm like i'm just leaving court i'm like why do you guys have a trump flag 
I'm like, this is this is the dot. I'm like, this is the East dot. And they were laughing like, man, we're sick of it. We're sick of the partisanship. The Democrats haven't done anything for us. And I, I have been very, very involved because my uncle's a developer in Wyandotte. And I know that it's not that simple. And I understand the difficulties with it. But we've got to start going in and empowering the communities. Like I said, with a sledgehammer if we have to. One of the things that I brought up to Mayor Alvey and Doug Bach is stop tearing down historic houses. Waldo is the house that I moved out of in Waldo. When I bought it, I bought it in 2009 for 121500 When I sold it, I sold it for 155000 One year later, it sold for 256000 because it was in a historic neighborhood. If we would stop paying 10 grand every pop to go into Quindaro and tearing down black people's houses uh, to be able to clean up the area and get these congregated uh, sections of land that they're talking about, it would help. We need to start empowering the community. If we need to find a developer willing to go in there and buy up uh, grandma and grandpa's house or whatever people own an area and give the community a reason to try, give them hope, let them know that it's possible. Uh, the Kaufman Foundation, um, and even, I, I mean, I know probably shouldn't be bringing up in this one, but Trump uh, brought up the black empowerment loans and things like that. That's the type of things that we need to do. We need to stop having Mr. Whitey go in there and try to fix an area and start empowering the communities, whether it's black, whether it's Mexican, whoever it is. I'm sorry, this is a passionate one for me because I've lived it and I've breathed it, and man, it gets on my nerves that we can fix the problem if people really want to. Thank you. Kathy Moore, your response. Well, thank you, Murrow. So I tend to agree with some of the comments that um, Pam Curtis made. I think that, um, I don't know if this is on the radar of the Department of Commerce, but that's something we could certainly work on and we could certainly work closely with Wyandotte Economic Development Council. I do think that the, um, development downtown you know we've been waiting for that to take off for years every every time we thought we got a little bit of a, a a little bit of something going it never quite panned out it seems like it finally is with a with a strawberry hill hospital down there with the Merck, with the kansas city kansas community college hopefully moving a building down there and i'm hoping if that's successful that some of that will um, lead to better development in the um, Northeast area because people do, they want services. It's, it's a little bit like the analogy to rural Kansas. You know, if you don't have serve, we're so worried about rural Kansas and the state because um, so many of those services just aren't available anymore. And so when you don't have services, people tend to move out. So um, I, I I just think we have to make a concerted effort on this front because wouldn't it be wonderful to see successful development in there finally? Okay, Stan, your response. Merle, Stan asked me to let you know he had to get off to get on a different Zoom call. Okay, all righty, we'll move ahead then. Next, we move to JD Rios and his question, JD. Okay, well, perhaps I'll uh, be educating some folks again. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm an old time educator, so, right. Two part question again. Uh, wondering if you're aware that residents with an individual tax identification number, ITNs, who are state tax filers, are taxed twice in the state of Kansas. Why penalize and how fair do you think a system is that for an example, an undocumented individual with an ITN pays state taxes that are deducted from their payroll, but if they file state taxes using the ITN, they essentially have to pay the state tax again since the state of Kansas does not recognize the state tax withheld on their W-2s. Kansas recognizes the income, but they do not recognize the taxes already paid. And I have to ask, do you disavow white supremacy 
and institutional racism that affects the lives of black, brown, and indigenous Kansas, especially in education, the criminal justice systems, and healthcare. Okay, we'll start with Kathy Moore. Kathy? I had a feeling you'd start with me. Well, the second part <laughs> of the question is very easy. Absolutely condemn um, white supremacy and uh, everything else you said, John. That's just an easy answer that really should flow off everyone's tongue. As for the tax issue, I'll be honest and say I am not familiar with that. So I will have to um, do a little research on that. Any answer I give you would um, not be appropriate because I'm not familiar with the issue. Okay. Jordan Mackey, your response. Mr. Rios, I appreciate the uh, insight on that. With the, I'll address the back part first. Uh, you got me tearing up because, um, ooh, sorry. Uh, I'm a tiner. And what that means in Wyandotte County is that I'm black and Mexican. I have family members that are, um, well, that are more recently legal and even some that are illegal. Uh, and, and that's one thing. Being a Republican, I hear that a lot. It comes up all the time. It's a personal issue for me. Um, sorry. And uh, I absolutely disavow it. I mean, I'm trying not to cuss. Sorry. <laughs> I gotta be careful. Um, yeah, that stuff pisses me off. Uh, as I said, I grew up in Quindaro. I grew up in Central, in Troost. Uh, American people are my people. And, and I mean, I, I've roofed with Mexicans. I've roofed with guys that are illegal. And they're some of the best workers that you will ever find. But one of the, the jokes when you're doing jobs like framing or roofing is you're working like a white man, like a, like a white dude, man. Come on, pick it up. And that's probably not appropriate for this call, but it's real life. It's what happens on the jobs. Yes, I think in Wyandotte County, we need to make a concerted effort to reach out to those individuals. I'm not really familiar with the ITN, I believe is what you said. Uh, most of the guys that I know honestly do cash jobs. And they do cash jobs because they have to hide or they have to worry about their life day to day. I mean, day in and day out. And some of them, they'll bust their butt trying to do things as legal as they possibly can. I've known guys that have set up LLCs with a family member that's legal and they'll run the money through that LLC because they want to be citizens. They want to be part of this country and they want to pay their taxes. They're proud to be here. Uh, I mean, the, the crap that you hear on the news of the people flooding in and stuff like that, I mean, maybe so, but it doesn't exactly happen in Wyandotte. It might be in the uh, border states and things, but the guys that I've worked with are amazing individuals. They're, I mean, thoroughly in, based in faith and family, and they work their butts off, and they do everything they can to uh, pay their taxes. So with the disembowelment of all the racism stuff, absolutely, unequivocally, no question. Uh, and with the ITN thing, I'll protect any guy that's willing to, or man or woman that's willing to work their butt off, and I'll do whatever I can to help them in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Tom Burroughs, your response. Well, thank you, Merle. Uh, I too would disavow those those issues that uh, JD brought up. Uh, I would state that those of us that have grown up in one of the most diverse communities in the country know what it. We we have tasted racism. We have tasted isolation. We have witnessed derogatory comments and actions. But yet in Wyandotte County, we've grown to embrace our diversity. We have so many ethnic festivals, so many opportunities in which we congregate collectively together as, as different ethnicities. And that has helped us as legislators carry that message forward in the legislature. But as it's been discussed, a majority of the legislature is not as diverse or doesn't come from as diverse a community as Wyandotte County. And when we bring those issues forward, it is a challenge for us to try to get people to understand the issues that we and the big people of our community are experiencing and why things need to change. We, we understand any discriminatory action is just flat out wrong. 
how many years did the LGBTQ community struggle to get recognized w uh, across this country? I mean, it's not only just racism and supremacy, it's just the indignant approach to others different than us that must stop. And I, I truly stand ready to continue to develop any relationships, to work with anyone and everyone that embraces us as a race, and that's the human race. I have to commend JD on the tax question. That is one I have not been able to find information on to get a solid answer to you, JD. And I'm being uh, transparent in stating that was a really good question. That was a that was a million dollar question of the night. So thank you. But uh, I stand with Kathy and others. Uh, I'm sure that we'll have a chance to review that. And you know, please don't don't be remiss in not reminding us to look into that, JD. I will. <laughs> Thank you, Betty. <laughs> okay. Greg Conchola, your response. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Rios, for asking that question. I, too, am going to answer the second part. I would condemn racism in any form. Any form that it comes in is not right. We are one race. We are the human race. And we all need to get along together and work together to make Kansas a better place. And I also have to plead ignorance on the first part of your question. I'm not familiar with the ITN, and it is something that I would look into and would like to study even more. Okay. Uh, Pam Curtis, your response. Um, thank you. And uh, second question, easy, absolutely condemn um, white supremacy, um, any racism, institutional racism, any of that, we, we need to definitely all be together in that. So, um, and on the ITN, had no idea, but um, that's definitely something that is worth looking into to see if it requires a legislative remedy or if it's something that, you know, can be done um, otherwise. But yeah, I think we'll definitely look into that. It sounds like there's several of us that'll be looking into that. So maybe we'll do it jointly and find out. Thank you. Louis Reese, your response. JD, on the first part of your question, when you find out, get back to me. On the second part of your question, yes, I disavow all those groups, even Proud Boys. One of the things I said, I'm the ranking member on the Fed and State Committee where all the discrimination, uh, the abortion, uh, the guns come through this committee. We struggle to bring the discriminated class of LGBTQ uh, uh, into a, a committee to, to, to discuss it. People just don't want to talk about it. You know, talk about racial discrimination, which, you know, allows people to, to, uh, uh, talk, to, to discriminate, not only not racial, but uh, religious, to be able to discriminate on the basis of religion. But as far as sexual preference, same-sex marriage issues like that, that's all falls in those different classes. Uh, and, and I'm sad to say that we have our, our resident uh, bigot races coming back to the Senate this year, Virgil Peck, who wanted to shoot Latino uh, immigrants like feral hogs from helicopters. He won his Senate seat, so he'll be back in the Senate this year. So there's gonna be other challenges. As, as you looked at the primaries, and hopefully the primaries won't hold true through the general, the legislature is going to move farther to the right. We had some of our good moderates, and especially in the Senate, get beat. That's pretty scary. <clears throat> but as far as your second question goes, yes, yeah, strongly. Just based on where I grew up and how I grew up and what I've seen, I'm, I'm there. Okay. Thank you. Now we go to Valdinia Wynn. Your response. Thank you. And needless to say, um, your first question about the tax and, and really some of your other questions, we will have to um, probably first talk to the department because this is strictly a Department of Revenue issue that um, you know, we need to know about. And needless to say, on the second question, um, thankful that I have colleagues who have expressed their, their uh, opposition. Um, opposing white supremacy, institutional racism, I have um, shown visibly, verbally, 
um, against institutional racism in the state legislature. And as one of our representatives said, when you bring up and make the, the, the acknowledgement that this law is a racist law, that was when I was called on the carpet. Um, they tried to expel me. So that this issue of white supremacy and, and institutional racism is, is, is a real thing that we will have to, to stand. And when we do stand up, there, there will be consequences. And I, for one, am, am willing to um, accept those consequences because it's wrong, it's illegal, uh, and it's evil. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you to all who participated in this forum. This program has been taped and will be replayed on the Community College's public access channels and YouTube. The forum is adjourned.